Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named The Fall of the House of Usher. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with the Usher family's two siblings, Roderick and Madeline, who transformed their pharmaceutical company into an empire replete with wealth and prestige. However, the heirs to the Usher family empire met with several enigmatic accidents and suicides, which had claimed six lives of Roderick's children. Because of that, the once burgeoning Usher family rapidly dwindled. Later, deep into the night, Roderick summoned Prosecutor Dupin for a meeting. Dupin made his way to the address sent by Roderick, only to find the building eerily silent and dilapidated. Inside, Roderick was sipping expensive cognac. Roderick had called the prosecutor to disclose the reasons behind his six children's deaths. Hearing that, Dupin immediately took out his recorder as the secrets of the past began to surface. The scene flashes back to 1953, when the old house was not yet so decrepit at that time. It was where the Usher siblings grew up. Their single mother spared no effort in caring for the family. She was the secretary to William, the CEO of Fortunato Pharmaceuticals. William was a domineering man who favored corporal punishment on children. Therefore, the mother forbade the young Roderick and Madeline from nearing his house. However, the rebellious Madeline would not listen and insisted on sneaking into William's yard, resulting in Roderick injuring his ankle. The mother hurried to take her children away, only to be caught by William, who warned her not to come uninvited. Young Madeline demanded William release her mother, but failed to notice the undercurrents between them. Afterward, the mother brought her son home to tend to his wound, telling Roderick not to fear injury because sorrow and calamity were Jesus' kisses. Little did she know that this kiss would soon befall her. It was the summer of 1962, and the mother lay ill in bed all day, refusing medical help due to her tragic faith, not wanting her body contaminated by medicine. Madeline had had enough of her mother's ignorance and decided to seek William to persuade her mother, for her mother had always adored her boss, her hidden love for him evident to all. However, William, fearing any association with the two siblings' mother, mercilessly turned them away. Soon after, their mother died in her bed. The siblings did not call the police, but instead crafted a wooden coffin and buried their mother in the backyard. To their dismay, a night of heavy rain washed away the soil, and the corpse inexplicably vanished. A trail of wet, muddy footprints led to the living room, which might indicate that their mother was still alive. So the two siblings immediately entered the house for a search. Amid flashes of lightning and claps of thunder, Madeline pointed behind her brother. There stood their mother, covered in mud. But suddenly, she grasped Roderick tightly by the throat. Madeline quickly explained that they didn't know she was still alive. Hearing this, the mother released her son and walked out into the pouring rain, silent. The two siblings carefully followed her and witnessed their mother barge into William's house and strangle the heartless betrayer. She collapsed beside William's body, breathless. William's wife stood by, screaming in a chicken voice incessantly. Roderick and Madeline were in fact William's children. Once they had achieved success and taken over the pharmaceutical company, they paid to cover up their mother's murderous act, publicly claiming that William died of a sudden heart attack. Till now, Prosecutor Dupin couldn't understand why Roderick was telling him all this. Roderick explained that if they were to discuss his six children's deaths, this story was indispensable because it revealed Roderick's father's identity. Back to the revelation, from that night on, Roderick swore not to be like William, to never shut his children out. So he accepted all his illegitimate children, including six children born from five different women, treating them all equally. As he finished his tale, the only surviving granddaughter called, but he hung up without hesitation. Dupin couldn't help but wonder why he doesn't want to take her call if he claims to embrace all his children. Roderick complimented the prosecutor on his sharp wit, recalling the last time they met in court. Dupin's opening statement had left a deep impression on Roderick and was worth remembering. It was the last day all six children were alive. Their memories were pulled back to two weeks prior when Prosecutor Dupin, representing the U.S. government, sued Fortunato Pharmaceuticals for their involvement in the misleading marketing of addictive painkillers that had ruined countless lives. During the 40 years that Roderick and Madeline had been in charge, the company had committed numerous crimes but had repeatedly escaped legal punishment. The Usher family listened to his impassioned speech without a ripple of emotion, until Dupin mentioned he had a whistleblower from within the Usher family willing to testify in court. That's when Roderick's family lawyer became serious and objected, arguing that Dupin had violated the principle of basic disclosure by arranging for a witness without the defense's knowledge. With Dupin holding this trump card, he did not press further, and the court had to adjourn the trial. 
Upon returning home, Roderick immediately called a family meeting, determined to uncover the informant betraying their secrets. This necessitates an introduction of Roderick's six children. First, the eldest son, Frederick, married with a daughter, adores his father and eagerly awaits his inheritance. It's unlikely he would be the informant as it would harm the family's interests. The second child, Tamerlane, is striving with her husband to take their health product public. She hopes to win Roderick's favor through her impressive capabilities and performance. As for the third Victorine, she's the scholarly type, conducting live experiments with monkeys, researching a project related to cardiac meshes. The fourth, Napoleon, has no interest in vying for their father's favor. He's content to play the role of the rich kid, playing hormone hide-and-seek with beautiful girls and fully enjoying his privileged life. The fifth child, Camille, is indifferent to the pharmaceutical industry. Her forte is in media and public relations, managing the Usher family's public image. The sudden conspiracy of an informant has given her quite the headache, so she instructs her assistants to investigate thoroughly, vowing to find out the informant for her father. The youngest is a teenage boy named Perry, who has used the startup fund provided by his father to open a bar, aspiring to expand his flagship stores globally. In addition to these children, Roderick's second wife was also present at the dinner, although the children had not yet arrived. The family doctor, uninvited, came and spoke privately with Roderick about something that wasn't disclosed. After the conversation, Roderick seemed particularly downcast. The family dinner began shortly after, with Roderick returning to his usual demeanor. The children and their families took their seats, and Madeline had the family lawyer prepare several confidentiality agreements, which rule that anyone who leaks company or family secrets would lose their inheritance rights and be expelled from the Usher family, and Madeline vowed to ruin the informant until they vanished from this world. Roderick also offered an enticing reward. Whoever identified the informant would get 50 million. After announcing this, he left the dining room. Back to the present, Prosecutor Dupin couldn't help but ask if it was because he mentioned the presence of an informant that these murders occurred. But Roderick slipped up in his denial and claimed he knew who the murderer was. This brings us to New Year's Eve 1979. Roderick and his sister Madeline, dressed in their masquerade ball attire, hurried into a roadside tavern, which led them to meet the tavern owner Verna, who is a pivotal figure in the tragedy. The siblings appeared extremely nervous that night, and Roderick had many stains on his hands, clearly having been through some significant event. That same year, Dupin was investigating Fortunato Pharmaceuticals. He discovered that many elderly people were deceived into signing up for drug trials, and their bodies were exhumed from their graves shortly after death. What's more, there were five similar cases in just a few days. Considering the stains on Roderick's hands, it's likely he was involved. This was the beginning of Dupin's focus on Roderick. Later, Fortunato Pharmaceuticals heavily promoted a new painkiller, claiming it was a stronger version of Tylenol, but the drug was addictive. Long-term use led to addiction and a descent into an abyss of dependency. Dupin grew more impassioned as he accused Roderick of being an unscrupulous businessman who deserved to be locked away for good. Roderick was the one to steer the conversation back on track. He wanted to discuss the death of his youngest son, Perry. Before Perry's death, Frederick had told Roderick that he suspected Perry was the informant for Dupin. He reasoned that Perry was an undeniable hedonist, quick-tempered and impulsive, disliking being under Roderick's thumb and having a strong disdain for his older brother. Fortunately for the family business, Perry was uninterested in it, focusing solely on his nightclub. He planned to throw parties in a soon-to-be-demolished illegal laboratory, unconcerned that the prosecutor's office was investigating these buildings that the Usher family couldn't claim ownership of. Perry used the buildings for pop-up nightclubs, inviting only certain wealthy individuals to revel, accessible only to exclusive members who received electronic link invitations that would expire if not opened within five minutes. Each member had to pay $10,000 to register, and with only 100 spots available per party, Perry could make $1 million from that alone, plus an entry fee of $5,000, totaling $1.5 million. To enhance the party's atmosphere, Perry needed illegal substances, so he turned to his most trusted brother Napoleon for help. As Perry was dreaming big about his future, his older sister Victorine suffered a severe setback in her career. Once again, the great ape undergoing heart transplant surgery in her lab lost its heartbeat. If she didn't produce results in six months, she would lose all funding. Worse still, if the experiment failed, it meant wasting their father's massive 200 million investment, a fact that quickly reached the sister Camille. 
Night fell, and Perry was still busy with his party preparations. The building had been abandoned for so long that the water supply system was no longer functional. Although he could have arranged for a municipal water pipe connection, the party was meant to be uninhibited and skirting the edge of legality, so any official involvement was out of the question. Perry planned to use the water tank on the roof as a temporary solution. When others asked if it would be ready by the next evening, he confidently said it would be, recalling the golden rule, whoever has the gold makes the rules. Roderick chuckled as he mentioned this, his thoughts leaping from one subject to another. He then circled back to this rule, which he first encountered on the office wall at Fortunato Pharmaceuticals, highlighted in an excerpt from the comic strip The Wizard of Id, which emphasized that whoever has the gold makes the rules. Roderick visited Fortunato Pharmaceuticals to pitch the painkiller to the new CEO. Being a bastard of the former CEO, William, didn't allow Roderick to soar to the top in the company. Instead, he was stuck as a low-level employee on the second basement floor. The new boss was focused on medical devices, because unlike pharmaceuticals, they didn't have complex chemical compositions and weren't subject to strict regulatory control. Roderick had to change tactics to persuade the new boss, questioning how many people needed medical devices in a year compared to the constant global demand for pain relief. The market for painkillers was an ocean of potential, low cost, high profit, and limitless prospects once successful. Roderick's speech was persuasive, but the boss opted for the safer route, sticking to his medical devices. Dejected, Roderick returned to his apartment. He was already married with children, and his wife was indifferent to the failed sales pitch, lacking ambition. But Roderick and his sister were deeply frustrated, thinking that one was a pharmaceutical expert and the other a genius in algorithms, and their talents were far too great to stop there. Madeline declared that if Fortunato Pharmaceuticals wouldn't help them, they would simply bypass them. As the scene shifts back to Perry's party, after resolving the water supply issue, Perry planned to give his brother Frederick a significant gift. He purposely invited his sister-in-law to the party, who was tired of her tasteless marriage and couldn't resist the temptation. Telling her husband and daughter she was attending her best friend's get-together, she arrived at the party with excitement. Before entering, every guest had to lock their electronic devices in storage lockers and wear a bracelet-like key. Perry quickly noticed his sister-in-law and advised her to enjoy herself before returning to the second-floor surveillance room. Observing the socialites' misbehavior, he knew the footage was more valuable than the membership fees. If his brother discovered his wife's antics, he would be livid. Back at the party, Perry was surprised by the arrival of an uninvited blonde woman. Knowing all the members, he followed her and found her lying on a central bed. She was Verna as shown in 1979, who hadn't aged and was not of ordinary flesh. Verna urged Perry to stop his deeds, warning him of impending karmic retribution before disappearing into the crowd. She left a hint for Frederick's wife to leave quickly as disaster was about to strike. When the partygoers opened the water valve to heighten the atmosphere, they didn't expect the tank's water to be corrosive. The flesh of men and women, including Perry, fused together into a massive human carpet. After the tragedy, Verna approached Perry, kissed him gently, and placed a mask over his face. The police rushed to the scene upon hearing the news, with the family lawyer arriving first. He struggled to locate Perry among the mound of skinless bodies and took his phone. As he was about to leave, a survivor grasped his wrist. It was Frederick's wife. Back to the present, Roderick then revealed to Dupin that the rooftop tank contained not fresh water, but a corrosive pharmaceutical byproduct to avoid environmental fines. Perry's ignorance of the family business led him to use that tank. After the accident, Roderick found it suspicious that all service staff had left beforehand, possibly knowing about the tank's condition. Roderick instructed the family lawyer to handle the matter and find a scapegoat for Perry, keeping the Usher family out of the incident. Their PR prodigy Camille thought it wise to turn the situation to their advantage, posthumously rebranding Perry as a charitable, kind-hearted magnate to garner public sympathy. Madeline approved and left the execution to Camille. The Usher family's ruthless nature of turning every disadvantage into an opportunity was their secret to enduring success. Furthermore, Roderick resented Frederick for not heeding his advice to dismantle the illegal facilities months ago, which could have prevented the disaster. In the days that followed, the entire Usher family was occupied with Perry's mishap, except Camille, who, amidst the turmoil, did not forget her father's mission to find the informant. 
she placed spies among her siblings and unexpectedly uncovered Victorine's secret, who is fearing the exposure of her failed heart transplant and planned to replace the deceased research ape with a living one. Camille seized this chance and ordered her subordinates to keep close watch on her sister. At the moment, Victorine was on her way to the hospital to meet with a business partner when she unexpectedly encountered a heart patient. A bold idea suddenly popped into her mind. Pretending to be a doctor's assistant, Victorine took the woman's medical records. She excitedly flipped through the files, marveling that this woman was the perfect subject for her heart experiment. Little did she know, the prey she had set her sights on was the same Verna who appeared on the day of Perry's death. Returning to the case of Perry's demise, Dupin pointed out that during the autopsy, a derivative of the same painkiller was extracted from his body. But this part of the autopsy report was deleted afterward by the family lawyer via his connections. Roderick considered this a trivial issue since the painkiller had always been the muse for pharmacists. Sometimes he regretted allowing the new developed painkiller to hit the market, as the situation at the time was utterly out of control. It's then revealed that when Roderick pitched the painkiller to the new boss of Fortunato Pharmaceuticals, the proposal was rejected. However, the new boss used underhanded tactics to bypass Roderick and buy the patent for the painkiller directly from the development company. Furious, Roderick confronted his boss, claiming that the whole idea was his. But the new boss retorted that ideas were just farts in the brain and no one pays for a fart. However, he still gave Roderick a little benefit, allowing him to stay on as an assistant and continue to provide profitable ideas. Roderick's wife was pleased to hear of her husband's promotion and pay raise, and Madeline also agreed with the decision, recalling the first foster home they went to after their mother's death as an example. A despicable person had adopted five children, living off the foster care payments without working. The poor siblings, along with three other children, were cooped up in a small room. Feeling the injustice, Roderick bravely resisted and ended up locked in a closet, while Madeline slowly gained the trust of the foster parents. She then got hold of their ledger and reported them to the welfare agency. The current situation was exactly the same. The new boss was just a foster parent in a fancy suit. Roderick's job was to win his trust and then take him by surprise. Realizing that Roderick had to swallow his pride, after Perry's death, they investigated to find out if the staff had prior knowledge of the incident. They all identified a mysterious woman who had called the staff out of the party using various excuses. The family lawyer found the woman they were talking about in the surveillance footage, the masked Verna. Roderick and Madeline didn't recognize her immediately and instructed the family lawyer to continue the investigation. Fortunately, Frederick's wife was still alive, being the important eyewitness. As long as she was out of danger and regained consciousness, she could provide more information. At this point, Roderick and Madeline had no idea that the person they were looking for had already knocked on the door of Tamerlane's room. Tamerlane had a peculiar fetish for cuckolding. She enjoyed watching various women impersonate her and then watch her husband flirt with the imposters. Since the woman Tamerlane often hired was ill, she finally had found Verna, not realizing that this move was like inviting the Grim Reaper into their home. Meanwhile, Camille quietly infiltrated Victorine's laboratory and found the fake gorilla. She took photos as evidence. Unexpectedly, a female security guard appeared. It was the elusive Verna. Verna pointed out that using gorillas for medical research had been banned since 2015 and that 90% of human drug trials fail. Victorine's tormenting of these animals was in vain. She accused the Usher family of surely not having a single normal person. Camille was furious and prepared to teach her a lesson, but the guard leaped onto the operating table and imitating the movements of a gorilla, she approached step by step. Then, she tore open her coat, revealing a ghastly surgical incision. At that moment, she seemed to transform into one of those gorillas. Camille immediately took out her phone to record. The moment the flash lit up, the camera captured what was clearly a gorilla. When the lab staff arrived for work the next day, they found blood all over the floor. Camille had already been hunted by the gorilla. Meanwhile, Napoleon awoke from a hangover, only to discover himself covered in blood. Believing he might have committed a drunken homicide, he rushed to the bedroom to confirm his fears. Upon finding his friend still alive, he breathed a sigh of relief. Wondering where the blood came from, he followed the trail on the floor, only to discover the source behind some furniture. It's a black cat stabbed to death. Since the cat belonged to his buddy, Napoleon felt compelled to visit the pet hospital, planning to buy a similar one to take its place. The staff member who greeted him turned out to be Verna. Napoleon's trip was not in vain. He indeed found a suitable little black cat. However, Verna informed him that this was a pedigree cat with four adoption applications already filed for it. 
Unfazed, Napoleon flaunted his identity, saying his dad is Roderick. With the power of money behind him, he successfully took the kitten home, unaware that he had walked straight into Verna's trap. After returning home, he received a call from his father, which is how he learned of his sister's death. Napoleon had been close to Camille and couldn't fathom why she would go to the lab. Yet his family seemed indifferent to the fate of Camille, more concerned with how to handle public relations. Outraged by this, Napoleon erupted in anger, even demanding his father take back his inheritance rights and refusing to stay in the meeting room. Fuming, he stormed back home. Meanwhile, the family lawyer reviewed the previous night's security footage and discovered that the duty guard had been replaced. Regrettably, the pixelation made it difficult to identify the person's features. Madeline, with her keen intuition, realized that this fake security guard and the mysterious party guest could likely be the same woman. After the meeting, Roderick stayed behind to speak with Victorine, who was all too aware of the reason behind her lab visit. Roderick, seeing she couldn't provide a reasonable explanation, threatened to pull his investment. In response, Victorine hastily claimed her research was successful and that she was about to start human trials, thus managing to retain Roderick's investment. Having made such claims, Victorine had no choice but to accelerate the experimentation, tricking a patient, who was Verna in disguise, into signing a waiver. On the other hand, after Napoleon brought the cat home, he began experiencing a series of misfortunes, first finding a dead mouse under his pillow, then having conflicts with friends, and dealing with the cat's eerie and aggressive appearances, scratching him unexpectedly. Stranger still, no one but Napoleon seemed capable of seeing the cat in the house. Tormented to the brink of mental exhaustion and with dead birds and mice continuously appearing, he called the pet shelter owner Verna, claiming that the cat is deranged and pleading with her to take it away, or better yet, end its life. Verna pressed her ear against the wall, claiming the cat was hiding inside. As Napoleon followed the sound along the wall, the cat pounced out fiercely. In pain, he managed to grab the crazed animal and crushed its eyes in self-defense. Shockingly, Verna's eyes also popped out of their sockets, revealing that she had been controlling the cat all along. In the next instant, both the person and the cat vanished, leaving only strange noises coming from the wall. Enraged, Napoleon grabbed a hammer, ready to smash the wall and kill the bizarre cat. At the same time, Frederick was by his wounded wife's bedside, holding a new smartphone in his hand, which was found by the family lawyer in her bag. Frederick had never seen this phone before, and combined with his wife lying about going to the party, he couldn't shake the feeling that the phone contained secrets not meant to be seen. He tried fingerprint and facial recognition, but nothing could unlock the phone. He was getting desperate. In truth, the phone was a gift from Perry to his sister-in-law containing the electronic invitation to the party. Meanwhile, Tamerlane was also facing problems. Her husband, a famous online fitness coach, was a spokesperson for the Goldbug brand. Tamerlane would often watch her husband's live streams, until she unexpectedly saw that the mysterious Verna they hired previously had taken part in the recording. The couple had always pursued their sex hobbies privately, and none of the hired women pretending to be her ever interacted with her husband in public. This discovery made Tamerlane very uncomfortable. When her husband came home from work, she warned him that if he dared to interact with those hired women secretly again, she would kill him herself. Her husband found this baffling as he hadn't seen any such person during the day. Unfortunately, since the morning's video was a live stream, there was no way to replay it and check. The scene shifts back to Roderick and Madeline, who have received the enhanced surveillance footage. The familiar face in the video sends a chill down their spine. Later, Roderick starts hallucinating, seeing Perry's corroded corpse and faints on the spot. After Madeline rushes over upon hearing the news, Roderick hesitates but then reveals the reason for his hallucinations. It's revealed that during the family dinner at the beginning, Roderick had met with the family doctor. He has a hereditary artery disease that can lead to progressive dementia and hallucinations. His mother also died from this condition. Speaking of their mother, the siblings reminisced about old times. Roderick also mentioned his first encounter with the prosecutor Dupin. Back then, Dupin had come to investigate illegal drug trials at Roderick's apartment because all the consent forms for the experiments had Roderick's signature on them. But Roderick's wife immediately recognized that the signature wasn't her husband's. Before she could argue, Roderick stopped her. He couldn't afford to lose his job by misspeaking, so he insisted he knew nothing. 
Dupin, seeing the couple's modest life and their need to support two children, didn't press Roderick further and left his business card before leaving. At that time, Roderick truly was ignorant of the whole affair. Later, he informed his boss about the situation, wanting to know who forged his signature, but the boss kept deflecting, insisting that they were on the same side and that anyone would approve documents beneficial to the company, so the signature didn't matter. Roderick had to drop the issue of the forged signature. However, Madeline was furious when she found out about it. If the act was illegal and it came to light one day, Roderick could end up being the scapegoat. The Usher family name must not be tarnished. She told her brother to feign cooperation with the boss while finding a way to get on good terms with the prosecutor. Perhaps one day they could turn the tables on the boss. The scene then shifts to Napoleon's friend who went to his house to pick up a cat, but got quite a shock upon opening the door. The walls of the entire apartment were smashed to pieces, and Napoleon was swinging a hammer wildly, as if he'd lost his mind. The friend couldn't see the corpse within the walls, and thought maybe Napoleon had gone mad from drug use. Suddenly, Napoleon saw the cat dart towards the balcony, and he chased after it with his hammer in hand. Tragically, he plummeted down from the balcony. By far, Roderick had already lost three of his children. On the day of the funeral, many people attended, including the biological mothers of these children. He was visibly restless because since the night before, he had been tormented by hallucinations, constantly seeing his deceased children as they appeared at the time of death. His sister and wife had to support him as he left. Determined to prevent any further accidents, Madeline arranged bodyguards for the remaining three children, who were so vigilant that they even stood guard when using the restroom. That evening, the remaining three siblings gathered at the bar. Over drinks, they talked about their family. Aside from Frederick and Tamerlane, who were born to Roderick's first wife, the other four were all his illegitimate children. Victorine was the most reliable among the illegitimate ones. She proposed that regardless of their past relations, there were only the three of them left and they must stand united. Frederick and Tamerlane agreed, but old habits die hard. The trio hadn't been chatting for five minutes before Tamerlane and Victorine started quarreling, proving that unity was more difficult for them than scaling the heavens. On the other side, Frederick's severely injured wife finally regained consciousness, with only a skin graft surgery to follow. The doctor suggested a hospital observation of about 40 days, but Frederick insisted on taking her home. Victorine also encountered trouble when she returned home, as her business partner had found out about the human experiments. If the new product hadn't been successful on gorillas, how could they gamble with human lives? The partner threatened to expose Victorine's involvement, leading to a bitter argument. Victorine, fearing that her partner might actually report her, could only keep apologizing over the phone. It was then that she started to hear strange sounds. Listening carefully, she traced the noise to the smoke detector. After taking it down to inspect, she found it strange that the sound persisted and that she was the only one who could hear it. As the Usher family had been struck by three consecutive tragedies, the family lawyer petitioned the court to postpone the trial for the drug case. Prosecutor Dupin, of course, refused to agree. If the battle was drawn out, Roderick would surely evade legal punishment again. The family lawyer suggested that if Dupin wanted to proceed with the trial as scheduled, that could be arranged. After all, Dupin had previously claimed to have an informant within the Usher family. If Dupin would reveal the informant's identity, the Usher family would agree to attend the trial as planned. At this point, Roderick couldn't help but ask Dupin who the informant was, but he replied that there was no informant at all. He had simply wanted to cause discord within the Usher family. Roderick was delighted to hear this, amused that he could make the most upright prosecutor deceive the court. Roderick couldn't help but recall the incident from many years ago when he and Madeline had joined forces to deal with the boss of Fortunato Pharmaceuticals. Roderick knew that the boss had hidden documents of illegal drug trials. He had his sister Madeline use the pretext of selling computer technology to probe for the document's location. However, the boss couldn't have cared less about computer technology and insinuated to Madeline from the start that if she wanted to get ahead, she would have to rely on her relationships. Madeline, despite feeling disgusted, continued the conversation and eventually confirmed that the documents did indeed exist and were kept in paper form in the basement. However, she was certain the boss would try to destroy these illegal records during the construction of the new office, so they had to act first and get those documents as soon as possible. Taking a huge risk, Roderick sneaked into the basement and copied the incriminating evidence of the boss's crimes. As he finished his story, Roderick's hallucinations struck again. He saw Dupin's heart beating violently, blood soaking his white shirt, a vision corresponding to Victorine's death. 
Shaking off the vision, Roderick returned to the heart of the matter, continuing the story of the death of the six children. The family lawyer found a photograph of a woman on Napoleon's phone, the same woman who had been present at the first two children's death scenes. Roderick and Madeline recognized her as Verna, the owner of the tavern where they had met on New Year's Eve in 1980. But over 40 years had passed since then. Even if Verna were still around, she would surely be an elderly woman with white hair. The family lawyer, completely confused, urgently asked what was going on. Madeline explained that on New Year's Eve in 1980, Roderick had had an affair with the tavern owner Verna, who looked exactly like the woman in the photo. She deduced that it was possible she got pregnant back then and gave birth to a daughter who resembled her. Now, that daughter might be trying to eliminate her half-siblings to become the primary heir. Upon hearing this, the family lawyer asked for the tavern's location and immediately set off to investigate. Meanwhile, the mysterious Verna, disguised as a heart patient, had gained Victorine's trust, and they were discussing a transplant operation. Verna expressed a desire to talk to her original doctor before the surgery. If her doctor saw no issue, she would agree to the transplant. However, this doctor was actually Victorine's partner, whom Victorine naturally couldn't let Verna meet. At that moment, the strange noise in her ears resurfaced, causing her to lose interest in the conversation and escort Verna out of the office as she frantically searched for the source of the noise. Turning to Roderick, he was still thinking about Verna. Actually, Madeline got it slightly wrong. He had never had an affair with Verna and couldn't have fathered a daughter. The recent bizarre events, coupled with incessant hallucinations, were wearing Roderick down, even leading him to contemplate suicide. Yet he could never bring himself to go through with it. When Roderick couldn't sleep, he would go to talk to Victorine. In order to make all six children successful, he had always encouraged competition among them, failing to do what a father should. Roderick sincerely apologized to Victorine and expressed his gratitude for her successful heart mesh experiment because he suffered from hereditary artery disease. If his daughter's human trial was successful, there was a chance for his cure. It should have been a very touching moment, but Victorine seemed neurotic, asking her father if he heard strange noises that no one else seemed to hear. Roderick sensed something was off with his daughter. Suddenly he smelled a foul odor and followed it to open the bedroom door. There he was shocked to discover the mutilated corpse of Victorine's partner, the chest brutally opened and the medical equipment inside still pulsating. It turned out, days earlier, Victorine had lost control and killed her partner during an argument and had used the corpse to complete the heart mesh transplant experiment. For some reason, she had forgotten about this incident in the past few days and had been apologizing to her partner's voicemail. The strange noise she heard was actually the pacemaker-like sound made by the heart mesh equipment when stimulating the dead heart. Now, seeing the corpse, she finally remembered what had happened. However, Victorine's mental state had already deteriorated. She refused to accept the reality of her partner's death and ended her own life on the spot. Meanwhile, Tamerlane was busy preparing for the opening ceremony of the Gold Bug Health product. She was so preoccupied that she hadn't slept for days, and her mental state was worrisome. The constant nitpicking from her husband about the event only worsened her mood. She had chosen this health influencer as a husband for his clout, hoping he would endorse and promote the Gold Bug product. But now, this mere figurehead was trying to meddle in her crucial decisions. After a direct confrontation and argument with her husband, she began to experience eerie occurrences frequently. The green dress she picked out one second would turn black the next, and the kettle she used to boil water for coffee seemed to move instantaneously. She attributed these oddities to a lack of rest, thinking her eyes were playing tricks on her. With the product opening ceremony tomorrow, she needed to be fully alert. However, after a nap, she found her speech scribbled over messily. While puzzled, a shadow flashed by the door. She followed it and discovered a box with the gold bug logo on the kitchen island. Inside was a pile of bloody flesh and bugs inside it. Upon returning, the box was already empty. She quickly took some medicine, hoping for a good night's sleep to restore her spirits, but the usually effective medicine didn't work this time. Instead, she became more alert. At this moment, Dupin couldn't help but ask Roderick how he could know these things without following his children all day long. Roderick said it was because they all told him. He revealed that the six children's spirits were always with him, and all he had to do was continue listening. Back to the story, after witnessing the suicide of Victorine, Roderick returned to his office alone, not forgetting to take the heart mesh. 
This patent had cost a huge investment from him. Upon hearing the news of Victorine's death, Madeline rushed to meet her brother. If these children continued to die, they would lose control of the board because they all took some shares in the company. Roderick had to pull himself together. The next day, the tragic death of Victorine made the news, making the remaining two children nervous, fearing they might be next. Meanwhile, the family lawyer found a medical record at Victorine's house with a photo on the ID of the disguised Verna. Following the address on the medical record, the family lawyer arrived at the old home of Roderick's family, a place never disclosed to the media. It remains unknown how the mysterious Verna could have known about this address. The lawyer also checked the tavern Roderick mentioned and found that the plot of land had been vacant since 1975, with no tavern ever existing there in 1980. However, Verna did exist. Roderick used facial recognition to lock in her facial information and conducted a massive online search. The results showed that Verna had been seen with various influential figures for centuries without aging. It seemed that the enemy of the Usher family was not the daughter of Verna, but the immortal Verna herself. But Roderick couldn't understand why she would want to harm his children, especially when he had no quarrels with her. On the other side, Tamerlane was gearing up for her product launch event. She eagerly wanted her father to be there, to witness her success firsthand. However, Roderick was too engulfed in chaos to attend, and in the end, only Madeline was present. Tamerlane was disappointed, but she knew that as long as the event was a success, she could prove her talent to her father. Just as the ceremony began, she spotted a woman on stage wearing the same outfit as hers. She immediately went to confront her, only to realize the woman was just the host. Facing the audience, Tamerlane had no choice but to start her speech. Fortunately, she was competent, and she quickly managed to stabilize the atmosphere. However, just as the event was hitting its stride, she suddenly saw her husband's mistress in the crowd. Unaware that Verna was behind this, her emotions began to spiral out of control. The images on the PowerPoint changed to the boastful mistress, and a video of her husband's affair was played in front of everyone. Furious, she grabbed the microphone stand to throw at the images only to see the mistress approaching her. She threw the stand, but it ended up hitting her stepmother, knocking her out. The situation at the event spiraled out of control, and Madeline rushed backstage, only to spot Verna among the crowd. She chased after her, but the mysterious woman vanished on the spot, leaving Madeline's hands covered in filth. Meanwhile, the unhinged Tamerlane ran back home, where she thought she saw the mistress again. She grabbed the stick used for removing shoes and started hitting at the figure, but in reality there was nothing there. She shattered glass after glass, her limbs cut by the shards. But the hallucinations didn't stop. She jumped onto the bed, smashed the ceiling mirror, and then fell onto the bed covered in broken pieces, pierced by countless shards, and died a gruesome death. Now, out of the six children, only Frederick remains alive, putting the Usher family's position on the board in jeopardy. Although Roderick had dirt on the other board directors, more decisive measures were now necessary in the face of a new round of board voting. Frederick's shares were crucial. Roderick believed there was still a chance to turn defeat into victory. However, Madeline, watching her brother lose control, felt he was unfit to continue leading the Usher family. She secretly met with the family lawyer to discuss her completed algorithm project. She proposed that the company could move away from pharmaceuticals and officially enter the technology industry with concepts like artificial intelligence and virtual immortality. These were the future of the company. Madeline wanted to replace her brother and become the new CEO, and the family lawyer agreed to lend his support to her cause. On the other side, Frederick was unaware that his fate was about to take a drastic turn. He was at home, tormenting his wife, holding a grudge against her for cheating on him and attending Perry's debauched party. Thus, he trapped her at home, forbidding any doctor from visiting. He even added a paralytic to her IV, ensuring she would remain weak and bedridden. At that moment, Roderick called to arrange a meeting, informing Frederick that the board's vote was imminent and his stake was crucial. He must cast his vote for Roderick. Frederick, rarely feeling valued by his father, assured Roderick that he wouldn't be swayed by anyone. Roderick reminded him not to forget about the illegal building to avoid further complications. Soon, Frederick began to notice that the company's people were courting his favor. He was starting to savor the taste of power, fulfilling the pride that came with being the firstborn. Unable to resist flaunting his power, he intensified his wife's torment, even going so far as to pull out her teeth. Satisfied, he left the room, ready to take down the abandoned building. But his daughter arrived with documents, requesting her mother be transferred to a burn center. However, his stance was firm that no one was to move his wife. 
When his daughter tried to visit her mother, she too was locked out. As Roderick's story grew longer, the prosecutor's patience was wearing thin. He didn't want to waste more time, but then Roderick offered a deal. If Dupin listened to the end, he would hand over evidence implicating him in a murder. Dupin had no choice but to keep listening, but Roderick suddenly fell silent, caught in a bizarre hallucination, seeing his estranged wife holding the young Frederick. As he picked up the child, he realized the boy was severed in two, an ominous sign of Frederick's fate. Roderick, holding the child, couldn't help but remember the last time he held him outside the courthouse, where he had just obtained incriminating evidence against his boss, testifying alongside Dupin. But in court, Roderick changed his story, claiming the forgery did not exist and that he was testifying only to escape Dupin's harassment. This testimony ruined Dupin's future. It turns out, it was all a scheme by Roderick and his sister to get rid of the prosecutor and earn the board's favor. Roderick's wife, a woman of integrity, refused to accept her husband's actions and left with the children. The scene then shifts back to Frederick, who entered the abandoned building, took some medicine, and then proceeded to urinate on the spot where Perry was killed. He despised his brother for seducing his wife. But the medicine powder was tainted, causing him to collapse, powerless. The mysterious Verna then emerged, revealing that it's her who swapped the medicine for the same paralytic used on his wife. Disgusted by Frederick's treatment of his spouse, Verna mimicked his voice, ordering the construction workers outside to begin demolition. A massive sledgehammer smashed through the wall, bringing down rebar that cleaved Frederick in half. Upon hearing of his death, Madeline found Roderick alone, asking if he remembered their deal. The chimes of the new year seemed to ring in their ears, harking back to the year when Fortunato Pharmaceuticals gathered to welcome 1980. Roderick and Madeline, also at the masquerade, became the company's focus due to the perjury incident against the prosecutor. They mingled with the boss, drinking merrily, but never forgot that their biological father founded the company and their mother had diligently worked there for over 20 years. They wanted more than just to be valued, so they drugged the boss, and Madeline lured him to a secluded spot. As he attempted to take advantage, he suddenly felt dizzy and collapsed. Upon waking up once more, he realized he was trapped inside the foundation of a new building. Roderick and his sister were laying bricks, unswayed by the boss's pleas. Madeline told the boss to save his strength, as no one would return to work for a week due to the holidays. She finished sealing the last brick, etched with the words, You are so small. To cover their tracks, the siblings casually found a tavern to establish their alibi, where they encountered Verna. This enigmatic woman saw through their crimes and proposed a deal. She could make Roderick and Madeline the new boss of Fortunato Pharmaceuticals, granting them a lifetime reprieve from legal consequences. But their descendants would bear the sins, and only death could end the pact once made. Despising mediocrity, the siblings accepted. After the night, they left, only to see the tavern had vanished, which they dismissed as an illusion. However, their ascent at the company was swift, and with the newly developed painkiller, they became pharmaceutical legends, untouchable by the law. Presently, Madeline produced a bottle of 1980s painkiller, urging her brother to end it. Roderick knew there was no other option and ingested 80 milligrams, bracing for a painless demise. Madeline placed the bottle in his hand and left him to his fate, unaware that Verna would soon appear and revive Roderick as his lineage was not yet extinguished. Frederick's daughter was still alive. At that moment, the girl uncovered the truth about her father's abuse of her mother and unhesitatingly called the police. Despite the family lawyer's efforts to stop her, the girl courageously stood up to protect her mother. Roderick took comfort in this, seeing in her a resemblance to his first wife, the last vestige of conscience in the Usher family. Once, Frederick and Tamerlane had also possessed their mother's virtues, but Roderick had corrupted them with money after wresting custody from his wife. Only his granddaughter had remained steadfast. But now, even this precious gem was at risk of being taken. Verna approached the family lawyer, admiring the lawyer's exceptional skills, and presented a condition. The Usher family would soon perish, leaving all their crimes exposed, and the family lawyer would undoubtedly face prison. She could ensure his escape, but at the price of sacrificing a loved one. The family lawyer declared his solitude, refusing to strike any deal, ready to face his destiny. Verna respected his decision and vanished instantly. Subsequently, she sought out Frederick's daughter. Before taking action, Verna told the girl that her mother would pull through this tough time. Within three years, she would be completely healed. 
When Fortunato Pharmaceuticals dissolved, her mother would inherit a substantial fortune and establish a foundation in her name to help more people escape the clutches of illness. She would save hundreds, maybe thousands, and her good deeds would be passed down through the generations. All these futures would be possible because she had stood up to protect her mother. A single choice could impact the lives of millions. Verna wanted the girl to understand this before she took her life. After the revelation, Prosecutor Dupin immediately raised his doubts, mentioning that Frederick's daughter had just texted him not long ago. Roderick explained that Madeline had an artificial intelligence project that could scan the girl's social media and create a digital version of her. The text he had just received was from the digital version of her. Ultimately, the granddaughter's death left Roderick with no hope for life. As he watched the lightning-filled rainy night, he saw countless bodies slamming into the ground, all victims of the painkillers, casualties of his pharmaceutical empire. Faced with mountains of corpses, Roderick realized it was time to end it all. He then called Madeline to the family's old house. Even after learning of their granddaughter's death, she remained unfazed, fearless of Verna, still dreaming of her business empire. But the next second, Madeline felt weak and collapsed into her brother's arms. It turns out Roderick had drugged her drink, deciding to give his sister a queen's send-off. So he gouged out her eyes and set two sapphires into her sockets. They are the relics from the 19th dynasty of Egypt, once embedded in the eyes of a pharaoh. Roderick had spent years and a fortune to buy them as a birthday gift for his sister. Now that all was settled, Roderick urged Dupin to leave quickly. Unexpectedly, the basement door burst open and Madeline came out to flex her empty eye sockets. She wasn't quite dead yet. She then lunged at her brother, grabbing his throat. Dupin ran out of the room in fear, and the next second, the entire cabin collapsed, crushing the two siblings to death. Amidst the lightning and thunder, Verna's silhouette stood in the ruins, transforming into a jet-black raven. Legend has it that ravens are messengers of Satan, leaving behind only the echoes of death. Later, Dupin resigned and retired. Roderick's second wife inherited an estate worth $4.5 billion. Knowing no one could bear the weight of that money, she dissolved Fortunato Pharmaceuticals and donated most of the wealth. Meanwhile, the family lawyer was taken away by the police. He confessed to all his crimes, likely facing a lifetime behind bars. And so, the greedy Usher family met their end, and the drama concluded. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.